والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم Bismillah, alhamdulillah, you're watching the beauties of Islam. I'm Yusuf Festus, and today I want to talk about another of the beauties of Islam, and that's called understanding, the understanding in Islam. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that whenever Allah loves somebody and wants good for them, he gives them something called fiqh, fiqh ad-deen. What does that mean? It means he gives him the understanding of the deen. We've already discussed in previous programs the deen means the way, the way of Islam itself. Synonymous with the word Islam is deen. What is your deen? My deen is Islam. What is your way? My way is to surrender to Allah in peace, doing what he wants me to do. That's the meaning of the words. So here we have another word now, fiqh. Fiqh means in Arabic the way to get to somewhere. So these words need to work together because we said way, and this is the way to get to somewhere, and how do we understand that? There is another word, sharia. We've talked about this. The sharia of Islam means the place of watering your animals. Now, the place where you water animals doesn't move around. It stays where it is. But you can come to it from different avenues, from different directions. And this is maybe more or less the way to understand the difference between sharia and fiqh. Muslims know, for instance, that they are to establish the ibadah or worship with salawatul khams. Five times a day they establish their prayers. We say prayers. But how do we do them and how do we understand them? Well, let's take the word salah. And we mentioned this in another program too. Salah is what? It's a connection. The connection between you and Almighty God is your salah. So if I want to worship my Lord on His terms, I've now discovered I need to establish salah. I found that in the Quran. Allah's speech to me. He's told me in here clearly to ikama salah, establish the salah. So how do I establish it? I look to Muhammad, peace be upon him, and I find that he used to stand and bow and prostrate with his head down on the ground, and he would sit. Now, we gave a demonstration about this in another one of our programs so that you could actually see the format for this. But now I want to come to this word today talking about the fiqh. Because... We understand today that there are differences of opinions in some of these areas, such as, where should I put my hands when I stand in my prayer? Some people place their hands here. Some place their hands here. Some people put their arms down by their sides. Now, could they all be right? Or is only one right? Is one more right than the others? And to understand this, this is called fiqh, to understand that. What's essential in Islam, which is not negotiable, is the fact that you have to pray five times a day. If you change that, this won't work. But exactly where to place your hands is another topic. This can be understood by our scholars and teachers. We go to them, sit with them, and we can ask them, what is the evidence for this? A real scholar of Islam is pleased and happy that you ask this question because it gives them now the chance to discuss these issues. While I was visiting in Egypt, I went to Alexandria, Alexandria, Virginia. And when I was there, I visited one of the places where they used to teach all of the four schools of thought at the same time in the same place. It was really beautiful. We got some pictures of it too. If you visit our website, maybe you'll find them over there. Our website, by the way, is called beautiesofislam.com. But uh, to come back to this, I want you to understand that these schools of thought were not something remote and far away from each other. And they really weren't something like car lots set up across the street from each other where people are trying to get you to buy our car is better than their car. No, it was something where each of the schools of thought of fiqh could be explained and understood. And they could actually go right, walk just a couple of feet over to a scholar there and say, well, how did you understand that? Why do you guys have this? And why is it like that? 
And, and you find out ultimately it really isn't different. There is no difference in the main points. First point is there's only one God. Everybody agrees on that. Pray five times a day. Everybody agrees on that. That the Qibla or direction is toward Mecca. Everybody agrees on that. If anybody changes any of that, okay, then we're not going to accept that this is Islam anymore because it's not. Then how should you dress in the prayer? What should be recited in the prayer? Again, this is all common knowledge. We know. But as far as exactly where to put my hands, did you know that you should uh, follow your leader in Islam? Something Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told us, uh, particularly about the Salah, because he used the word Imam. There are different words for leadership in Islam, but Imam is the leader of the prayer, without doubt. He's your leader. So if you understood what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, then you can understand what to do in this situation. Because he said, follow your imam. Follow your imam. So when the imam, if he lifts his hands like this and puts his hands like that in the prayer, then this is what you should do as well. And if he said, oh, no, 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 because my teacher said so and so, hold on. Your teacher would want you to do what? Follow your imam. Because this is what the Prophet Muhammad taught us. And if your teacher would put his hands like this, but the imam you're following put his hands there, then it doesn't nullify your prayer or his prayer. Both of them have evidences. So do what your teachers tell you, but also follow your imams. And remember that it's not something to divide over, but something to join and unite on. This is the point that we're trying to make now, is how we unite together on this beautiful thing called fiqh. I want to take a break, give you time to think about what I said, and then I want to come back in the second part of the program and show you how to do resolution of the different schools of fiqh. Inshallah. Stay right there with more Duties of Islam. Islam is keeping up the pace. Islam is for every race. Brothers and sisters, to increase your evil. Khayrukum. من تعلم القرآن وعلمه ورتل القرآن ترتيلا Learning how to recite the Quran properly Learning the meaning of what we recite Concluding the ahkam from the verses which we recite Trying to implement what we learn in our daily life we Would listen to the participants and the guests Well take your phone calls We're gonna recite life we we'll listen to your recitation and we'll correct it according to the rules and regulations which will state in each episode. Now, your dream will come true. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, we're back here watching the beauties of Islam. And we've been talking about something called fiqh, the understanding or jurisprudence in Islam. And one of the things that we've discovered is that there are different opinions on some of the so-called minor issues in Islam. We discussed the salah. There are some other things, too, about in fasting exactly what time do we begin the fasting in the morning. And should we begin so many minutes before the adhan or right at the time of the adhan? And then exactly uh, some of the points of the Hajj. Uh, when do I say this and when do I say that? The point that's important on all of this is to realize that all of the great teachers of Islam said essentially the same thing. And I want to mention the, what's called the four schools of thought. There is the school of thought which is called the Hanafi. It's based on the teachings of Imam Abu Hanifa. Then there is Imam Malik's Maliki Fiqh. Then there is Imam Mashafi, and then there is Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal or the Hanbali fiqh. Now, so that you'll know that all of these gentlemen, all of these great teachers of Islam, they all lived in succession. They were not exactly at the same time. Abu Hanifa was the first in succession, and before he died, though, he got to meet Imam Malik. And before he died, he was one of the teachers of Imam Mashafi. Before he died, he was one of the teachers of Imam Afan David Hamel. And so that you understand, none of them were coming with a new religion. 
And all of them were basically taking from the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad so that the people could continue to perpetuate and preserve this way of life called Islam. None of them were making up a new religion. None of them were coming with a new deen. All of them said words to the effect that if you find anything in the book of Allah and the teachings of Muhammad that is contrary to what I said, then take what I said and throw it away. Other teachings that they've said, it is forbidden for anybody to take what I'm teaching unless you know from where I got it. Abu Hanifa would have never accepted that people would say that they're Hanafi, meaning that they follow him. He wouldn't like that because he wasn't following himself. In fact, he was following the teachings of Islam. He was following Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and what came with him. In other words, he was a Mu-Islam, a Muslim. The same holds true for each of the others after him. Imam Malik definitely would never accept that anybody would attribute to him such a saying that he's coming up with his own religion or you have to follow him. He was saying essentially the same thing. Follow the real teachings of the Quran and what you find in the teachings of Muhammad. The same is also true for Imam Shafi and Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And they said essentially the same things again. We're not coming with a new religion. And if you find anything that we've said that's contrary to something you find from the book of Allah or his messenger, then this is our opinion. Go with it. Take that. You have to realize at their time, they never even imagined or pretended that they knew everything about Islam. In fact, they said that if you found other teachings, meaning because they knew that Islam was going wide and being spread by many people, and there were many teachings of hadith or sayings of Muhammad that they had not received yet, had not reached them yet. Today, though, we know for sure all of the hadith teachings of Muhammad. They've all been preserved, collected, verified, authenticated, categorized, and we know exactly what he said. We know what he didn't say. We know what he did. We know what he didn't do. There's more been written about Muhammad, peace be upon him, than any other human on earth today. So from this, we can easily determine what was taught. So if we find something in the teachings of Abu Hanifa that isn't in accordance with the most authentic hadith, then it's fine for us to go ahead and look at those authentic hadith and consider that. But I caution you, and I caution myself, not to make that move, not to make that adjustment. Don't leave these teachings of your great teacher until you consult with a contemporary teacher today. Someone you can go to and ask him for some help in understanding because you might be accidentally taking something out of context or applying it the wrong way. So be sure to go to your teachers. Go to authentic sources. Go to the people of knowledge today. And there are many so many good teachers today in many countries. I advise myself and you on this point that although you might have a copy of Sahih Bukhari, you might have Sahih Muslim, you might have many books of hadiths or teachings of Muhammad, still it's not for you or I to go through those and thumb through and say, mm-hmm, I'll take this, that, no, I don't need any of that. I'll take a pound of this, a quart of that, No, because we're not going shopping here, okay? This is not the store of Islam. Instead, if you find something that seems different to you, take this now to the teachers, the scholars of Islam for help. Now, what we're doing with our website, and it's called Beauties of Islam, is giving you those windows to go to those scholars. You'll find connections to the scholars of Islam where you can reach them live with your questions and discussions. You'll find places where you can get videos like the one you're watching right now and text and many books and things, even the free Quran. All of it's available on our website. Now we're at the end of this episode again and we have to conclude, but I don't want to end until I tell you these words. May Allah guide you, guide you to his straight path and his terms and make it easy for you. And until next time, Remember, beautiesofislam.com. Peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Islam is peace. Islam is ease. 